may I have your attention? Please welcome TechCrunch Managing Editor, Matt Burns. What a morning! And... This is the best part. Serena Williams, Kevin Hart, and now Startup Battlefield. Thank you all for being here. I'm excited. I hope you were here yesterday. If you weren't, I want to bring you up to speed. We had robots. We had implantable heart monitors. We had AI-generated content for ad copy. We had smart, quick flashcard makers for students. It was wonderful, and we're going to have more of the same today. So I want to review the rules real quick. The companies have six minutes to present and they're going to get six minutes of questions and answers. You, the audience, I need you to bring the energy. These startup founders have worked so hard over the last six weeks to perfect their demos and their pitch, and they need that energy to thrive. So you, when we clap, you're going to clap hard, okay? With that said, we need to bring out the judges. We'll get this thing going. Okay, number one, as I read their bios, we have Jameson Hill. Jameson Hill, partner at Base 10 Partners. He's as a partner to lead the advancement initiative after spending seven years at Bain Capital Ventures, where he led growth investments into marketplace businesses, leading software companies and fintech companies. Prior to Bain Capital, Jameson was an early employee at Bonobos and started his career as a management consultant at Bain Capital. Next, we have Charles Hudson. Charles Hudson is the managing partner and founder of Precursor Ventures, an early stage venture capital firm focused on investing in the first institutional round of investments for most of the promising software and hardware companies. Prior to founding Precursor Ventures, Charles was a partner at SoftTech VC. Next, we have Dave M Municello. Dave is a GV's general partner lead who leads the firm's digital investment team, spanning its consumer and enterprise and, and frontier practice areas. He prioritizes time spent building long-term relationships with technologists who peak in curiosity, drive, and vision. Dave himself is deeply curious about data platforms, data science, developer tools, infrastructure, and enterprise software. Next, we have Emlyn Shaw. Emlyn co-founded Flourish Ventures, a $500 million global venture firm that invests in fintech and purpose. She leads the U.S. portfolio team and sits on boards of Unit, Kin Insurance, SeedFi, Clerky, and Cushion. She led the firm's investments in and provides guidance to Bright, Chime, and Propel. Last, we have Milo Werner. Milo is a general partner at The Engine. She serves as a board member for Mori, Atlantic Quantum, and Foundation Alloy. She sits on the boards of UVM College of Engineering and Mathematical Science, Axel Higher, Informative Electric, and a board observer online. Previously, she was at Ajax Strategies, where she was a partner, leading mid-stage investments across energy, transportation, agriculture, and industrial applications. Give them a round of applause. Thank you for being here, guys. So once again, we're going to bring out five companies during this round, and then later in the day, we're going to have five more companies. After today, the TechCrunch editors are going to narrow down the 20 companies you saw over the last two days to five companies who will present again tomorrow to a new round of judges. But let's get this round started. First up, from Bellevue, Washington, we have Ally Robotics. Presenting for Ally Robotics is Mitch Tolson and Jennifer Christensen. Come on out. I was a laborer. Everything I know about the future of robotics comes from my days working on the manufacturing line and the job site. I think about how I learned how to lay brick, wire electrical, and frame a house. People showed me how, and we used the right tool for the right job. I've worked on robotics projects for over 20 years, and I've repeatedly asked, why can't robots learn the same way? Why are they so expensive? and difficult to train. So why is this important now? There is a labor crisis in the US across the construction, agriculture, restaurant, and manufacturing industries having a $1 trillion negative impact on the US economy. So what do we do? Factory in robotic innovation has focused on factory automation that doesn't translate well to everyday automation. 
these industrial robots have big external control boxes with difficult to manufacture strain wave gears and legacy PLCs, limiting where robots need to go in the future. These robots are also focusing on costly, extreme precision. Let's say I want to cook french fries or install solar panels. I don't need plus or minus 0.01 millimeters of repeatability when one millimeter is good enough. We must create the right tool for the right job. Introducing the ally arm. With a combination of machine vision, imitation learning, AI, and hardware innovation, we can significantly expand the market for robotic technology and everyday automation. So how do we do this? We've opted for proven planetary gears that are 97% efficient and 20% the cost of strain wave gears. We've removed the external control box and you can power the Ally arm from a standard 110 AC outlet or for those in mobile applications, natively 48 volt DC. We've developed a novel joint that allows to put more electronics into the base, improve wire routing and mechanically couple joints one and two for smooth motion, double the torque at no velocity loss. We've even invented a quick change actuator. Now, anyone will be able to service the robot, just like replacing the batteries in your flashlight. We even use something called the endoskeleton based design. So think of a human arm. You have your skeletal structure, you have skins. Just the same, we have robotic skins that can be adapted to the application requirements. So whether your scenario is clean food automation or pulling recyclables from a landfill, we have the skin for you. The opportunities are endless. The most challenging aspect of robots today is they take hundreds of thousands of dollars to program and train by experienced professionals, greatly limiting automation for everyone until now. The Ally Arm is both smart and simple. What you're seeing here is just the beginning of translating human gestures into robotic motion. Oh, here we go, here we go. We even have control over the end effector and other devices connected to the arm. I started the company nine months ago, and what you're seeing here is three months of our effort. When we are done, even my five-year-old will be able to program the robot by showing it, and the robot will then repeat that task. There it goes. So this is what we call a micro behavior and you can create a bunch of these. Grabbing cups, grinding, sanding something, and then you can repeat that. The ally, can I go to slides? The ally arm is the first robotic arm designed from the ground up with AI and learning at the core. We are collaborating with NVIDIA to adopt the Isaac platform for edge compute, AI, and simulation to accelerate our development and provide the best development tools, not just for developers, but anyone. We also have customers. We have a $30 million letter of intent with Miso Robotics, and we have $400,000 a month in monthly services from Bobachino, Ryko, and others. The Ally Arm is the smartest, most affordable, easy to service, and simple to train robotic arm. And together, we're enabling robotics for anyone, anywhere. Thank you. Mitch, that was wonderful. Nine months and we're here? Yes. That's great. All right. Well, uh, Dave, let's, go, let's start with you. 
<laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so uh, prior to my time at Google Ventures, I was at a, a company called Kiva Systems, yes. automated <laughs> warehouses with robots, yeah. and have spent a bunch of time thinking about uh, sort of the balance of specialization with robotics and being more flexible. It seems like you've erred towards being more flexible, able to be trained by humans. Yes. Does that change the way that you go to market with a company? So if a, if a company is really excited about purchasing your robots, working with your robots, don't they require some sort of specialization, integration, you know, specific training for their workflows? And how do you think about the balance between specialization and more general approaches? Well, I'll start and then yeah, add on to me. Uh, so I do not have any programming background. Um, I have an engineering background, but skip the programming side. Uh, I train it via right now sign language, right? It's a step to where we show the robot what we want it to do. So down the road, we would take the arm and I would just pick up the brick and move it and it would do that. <coughs> so as we go into any type of workflow situation, it would be similar. If someone needed something different, of course, we'll work with a customization piece to that. But otherwise, it will really be as simple as showing it what you want it to do. You want it to grab from that shelf and move it over there. You want to move it from that bin to that bin. You don't need a technical background to be able to do that. So it's part of the, the anyone, anywhere you know, concept. And, and just given that... Oh, oh, can I just oh, follow no, up? Sorry. Oh, okay. uh, and just given that it's generalizable, are you finding that often the applications are similar to what a human would be doing? Is yes, that the alternative? Absolutely, thinking? right? I mean, so when we look at cooking french fries, for example, if I'm standing in a quick service restaurant, I'm having to grab the basket probably with two hands. I have to shake it, I'm around the oil, I have to make sure I'm hitting the timer, helping people doing these other things. A robot does that so much better and can do it consistent. And uh, my background's in ergonomics, so you don't have to sit there and do that. Uh, the robot can do that. I can focus on managing the process, helping people, and doing what you know, we're better at as humans. Cool, thank you. I did French fries at Wendy's and I was pretty good at it. <laughs> Jameson, let's go to you. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, remarkable for three months of effort. Thank you. Uh, I'm curious, with the sort of initial customer set that you're talking to, can you speak a little bit about implementation? Um, and I'm particularly curious about time to value and then also how much behavior change is required on the part of the customer. Take that one. So first, uh, before I started Ally Robotics, I wrote a white paper on why robot companies fail. That, the, the key thing there is a lot of, I saw in my research showed a lot of companies don't focus on the customer. That's right. So we that's how we started. We first found the customers, un, deeply understood their problems that they want to go solve. And then we've then taken those sort of, here's what market and industry technology is not doing, and mm -hmm. here's how we can go about solving those. So when we look at food automation, this is where we're starting. It's what are the intrinsic things within this environment and how do we, develop an architecture that scales beyond food automation when we're solving for food automation initially. So as an example, this, our endoskeleton design with the shells, in clean food automation, you need NSF 169 certified skins, but that's gonna be a little bit more expensive for that type of skin, right? Sure. But if I'm putting uh, this arm in some other environment that doesn't need IP65, why pay for that? And so that's kind of the little bit of the integration effort that we're doing. Terrific, thank you. Milo? Yep, um, great work, super impressive. Um, you're not the first ones to try and crack this nut. Um, think of Rodney Brooks, a uh, phenomenal roboticist out of yeah. MIT, founded iRobot. Yeah. His next company was Heartland Robotics, right? Yeah. And that was a multi-purpose robot that was meant to work alongside people and easy yeah. to train, very similar. Yeah. Could you just talk a little bit about how you feel you're solving this problem in a different way that's gonna be successful? I'll, I'll build on what I said just before. It really starts with our initial set of customers and designing to that first that allows us to solve their need immediately, bring in revenue, and then integrate and implement to solve their, their issues and their challenges incrementally. So it's things like, um, I'm, we're not trying to tackle all the problems all at once. For example, with Miso Robotics, they have an opportunity, a, a new client of theirs might come and say, hey, I wanna cook a uh, different style of French fries, right? They need a different dwell time and I need a different behavior. So it's then we focus then on the problem of how do we help them speed up the training of that behavior with visual training? And it, then it's a discrete problem to solve and then over time, these solved discrete problems amalgamate into a larger set that's more agnostic. Great, thank you. Charles? Can you talk a little bit about 
cost profile and the payback period for your customers, how they think about, how they think about ROI? Sure. So we have not set pricing yet. Um, that will come as we move towards manufacturing and, and have that. Um, but we have kind of two paths for customers right now that we're envisioning. One where they could purchase the arm or arms, you know, multiple outright, or they could do robots as a service. Mm -hmm. And we would work with them on, you know, monthly, yearly, whatever that may be. Um, the return period, um, you know, part of our pitch is that it's affordable. So that's a big piece of what we'll be trying to, to you know, drive home and competitive with our customers. But as we move forward, we will also, um, we'll have a return period, but the money that we get net is all gonna flow right back into Ally because we wanna be able to scale and grow and go faster. So that's Thank you. Thank you very much. That ends our time with your company. Appreciate it. Thank Give you them very a much. round of applause. Yeah. Thank you.